All right, Nuclear Decay Lecture 2, and I think this is my favorite of the three because it's a pattern. There's a graph, and I can follow the graph, and that makes me happy. The equations for decay weren't bad. They were logical. You'd need to, if you were taking a quiz on this, remember what makes what, and that's probably the hardest part about that. So, for patterns of nuclear stability, right on that first page is a chart that I just, I just love. The fact that it shows the band of stability. And we're going to go to that in a minute. So neutron to proton ratio. Patterns of nuclear stability. Where am I going with this? No single rule allows us to predict whether a particular nucleus is radioactive. And if it is, how it might decay. So how can we predict which type of decay is likely? My thing to tell if something's going to decay is what I was doing last time. I go to the symbol for the nuclide. And if it looks weird... If it doesn't look periodic table right, I say it'll decay. What I mean by that is if I write the atomic symbol for sodium from the periodic table, it's number 11, so I have sodium, 11 for its atomic number, and its mass on the periodic table is 22.99, so I would say that's normal sodium. If you tell me 25 at the top, I'm going to be like, something's wrong with that thing. And that's normally when decay occurs, when something's wrong with that thing. So that's what I'm keeping an eye out. There are way more scientific ways to do this than me going, something's wrong with that thing. I say that about my dog, and she just looks at me. You can definitely tell more scientifically with nucleides. nucleides. So neutron to proton ratio is a big one. Think about it, neutron to proton ratio. If you learn, if you remember... Counting protons, neutrons, and electrons back in Gen Chem. When you started counting them for the lower numbered atoms, a lot of times they were equal. Carbon is six straight across the board. Nitrogen is seven. Seven protons, seven neutrons, seven electrons. Oxygen is eight straight across the board. And most years I get a kid that when I get to like phosphorus, goes, that's not the same. That's 16 and 15. I said, just wait. We did the mercury one where it was 120 and 80. So you get out of balance. But for lower numbered atoms, a lot of times your numbers of protons and neutrons are the same or one different. So what is the nuclear force? Your nuclear force is a strong force of attraction existing between nucleons at close range. Basically, that means the particles in the nucleus attract each other. But the positive-positive jam-in of protons isn't very nice. Because remember, like repels like. Positive charges, if you take the positive ends of two magnets and try to jam them together, it is not a good thing. They're not liking that. They're like, mm, nah. So the more protons in a nucleus, they need a little bit of space. The more neutrons you need for stability. So to have the neutrons in there as a buffer to stabilize your nucleus. Stable nuclei, and this is important. It's the same number of amino acids in the human body. This is a pretty big number. Stable nuclei up to 20 protons have equal number of neutrons. So they're equal or one off, up to 20. Above this number, you get more neutrons than protons. So your little arrow thing, a little greater than, less than, points toward protons. Pac-Man eats the bigger number. Pac-Man's eating your number of neutrons. The neutron to proton ratio increases with increasing atomic number, hence the graph that goes up. I love the stable atomic nuclei graph, like I said. What you got there? What shows the belt of stability on this graph? Your belt of stability is where stable atomic nuclei are found. Notice it kind of like whoop, up. The dotted region whoop, shows your belt of stability. That's where your stable nuclei are found. It ends, and this is important too, at number 84, which is polonium. Above polonium, stuff decays. It's what it does. So all elements above that number are radioactive. The N slash P, neutron to proton ratios for the belt of stability, range from 1, like we said, you won't get more protons than neutrons. They can be the same or have more neutrons. So you can go from an equal ratio like carbon with 6 and 6, nitrogen with 7 and 7. Your highest you're going to get... It's 1.52. Page 881 of the Brown text has info on that. It's still in your book. This is like chapter 21, I think. So your types of decay predicted. 
Above your belt of stability, we do beta emission. That's giving off the high-speed electron. It does change your atomic number and brings the number back to the belt of stability. Why do we do this? The beta emission decreases number of neutrons. Huh. So if I'm above the belt of stability, too many neutrons, I'm going to give off that electron, change the neutron to the proton, be good to go. So if I'm below the belt of stability, again, this isn't going to happen with a one-to-one -one ratio, but if you get to the point where you're stable at like 1.3 and you don't have enough neutrons, nuclei below the belt of stability undergo positron emission or elect electron capture. Why? Increasing the number of neutrons using those, they also decrease your number of protons. So you're actually, by using those, taking two steps to get back to your belt of stability. Which of these two is more common for lighter elements? Positron emission. And for heavier, electron capture. Nuclei with atomic numbers 84 or above undergo alpha emission. If you check it out, remember, there, now we're not on the chart anymore. If you go back to the alpha emission examples we did last lecture, they're all your cool higher number things, like thorium, like uranium. We were talking radon, we were talking the big guys, above, 80, above 84 there. So why are we using this? Because alpha emission decreases numbers of both neutrons and protons. So for a radioactive element to lose both, it becomes more stable because you can get it to where it's not radioactive anymore. You might even be able to get its number below 84. Question 21.17, predict the type of radioactive decay. Give it a shot. Hit pause for me. Cool. So for boron, 8,5, boron shouldn't be 8. Boron shouldn't be 8. Boron, if I go to the periodic table, is like 11. So it's going to be positron emission because it's below the belt of stability and it's a lighter element. So copper with 68, that's above, it'd be beta emission. When I say above, I looked at the mass on the periodic table and it's like 63.5. For phosphorus, my periodic table says 30.9. So phosphorus 32 is above, it'll be beta emission. Chlorine 39, I go to the periodic table, 35.453 above, beta emission. All I'm doing is comparing my mass number to the mass on the periodic table and seeing where it falls. So that's what I got. Came down to looking at neutrons and protons and checking where it should be. That's a radioactive series. That's all I have to say about it. It's a series of nuclear reactions, and this is a good thing. Series of nuclear reactions that start with an unstable nucleus and end with a stable one. So it's basically a process by which an atom, a radioactive atom, decays to make a stable product. That's good. Other stability info. Magic numbers, and I love that they call them magic numbers. Let me check my time. Oh, we good. Magic numbers. Numbers of protons and neutrons that predict nuclear stability. There is a handful of numbers that if you've got that many neutrons or that many protons, it's like perfect. If you've ever tried to stack things in an orderly fashion, you know that there's like the good number to stack and the bad number to stack. Like it's awkward to stack maybe 19 of something because you always have that one that's by itself. Or you get one that's too close to the edge if you have 47 and it just falls off. You have numbers of things that pack together better. There's a number of cans that'll fit in a box, a number of eggs that'll fit in an egg container. There are numbers of neutrons and protons that fit in the nucleus well and neatly and make a stable nucleus. Your magic numbers for protons, I'm just gonna snap this up, two, eight, 20, look how even these numbers are. These are nice numbers. 28, 50, can you still see me? Yeah, 82. Those are my magic numbers for protons. And if I just add on 126, those are my magic numbers for neutrons also. They're nice and even. I say they look stable, not like those examples I was giving, like 41. <laughs> even or odd? Stable nuclei tend to have even numbers of protons and neutrons. 
So go down here, do your next two questions, and we'll go over them. Hit pause. Hit pause because I'm going to talk again. <gasps> Pausing. And coming back. One of the nuclides in each pair is radioactive. Predict which is radioactive and which is stable. Why do you think so? Again, I'm looking for the one that makes me go, Ugh, from the periodic table. I can also see we like even. So, let's see what we've got. Well, I've got 19 for potassium. So, when I do my subtracting, the 39 potassium has 20 neutrons, and 40 has 19 neutrons. We don't like 40. We like K39 because it has an even number, 20 neutrons. I looked at 40 and went, that's not the mass on the periodic table. I don't like it. It's the other one. So bismuth, that's the stuff in Pepto-Bismol. It's number 82, which is already kind of nice. 82 is a nice number. If I subtract 82 from 209 and 82 from 208, I get that bismuth 208 is stable because it has 126 neutrons. Again, that's the right mass on the periodic table. Nickel 58 and nickel 65. Nickel is number 28. So nickel 58 has 30 neutrons, and nickel 65 has 37. Neither of them is a magic number. But we like nickel 58 a little better because it's even. Fair enough. Question 2121. Which of the following nuclides have magic numbers of both protons and neutrons? Helium, four. Go to your periodic table. First of all, for my number of protons, I went to the periodic table. It's the number there. Time check. Still good. Number of protons going straight down that first column. Helium, two. It's number two. Oxygen's number eight. Calcium's number 20. Zinc's 30. And lead is 82. Who's got magic number of protons? Everybody but zinc. Stinks to be you, zinc. Too bad. Everybody else has a magic number of protons. So neutrons, the way I have those written, it's easy to get neutrons. It's the number after the nuclide name minus my number of protons. Four minus two is two for helium. Magic number of neutrons, yes. Magic number of both, yes. Oxygen, 18 minus eight, 10 neutrons. Not a magic number of neutrons. So not magic number of both. Calcium, oh yeah, calcium is like beautiful. It's like helium, 40. So 20 protons, 20 neutrons. Yes, yes, yes. Magic numbers across the board. We love calcium. Zinc 66 is just all shades of bad. 30 protons, so 36 neutrons. Eh, that's going to fix itself. There's going to be some kind of decay shake in there with zinc 66 because it can't stay that way. Lead 208. Yes to the number of protons. 208 minus 82 was 126. Yes. So yes, yes, yes for lead. Everybody had at least one except zinc. So that's counting magic numbers, protons and neutrons. We've got one more lecture to go, and I believe it's on transmutations, which is a really fun word. Good deal.